So we've just heard this passage about the transfiguration of the Lord. And there's so much to think about here, but just in in three stages, we see the disciples going up the mountain to be with the Lord. We see lots of listening, or rather we hear, hear about lots of listening going on at the top of the mountain. And then the disciples stepping down the mountain with the Lord and going into what is ahead of them. So just a, a brief thought about this, these stages of, of this gospel story. Going up the mountain to be with the Lord. Um, and, and just to share two very powerful experiences of being with the Lord that myself and some of us have experienced just in the last week. One of them was going on retreat last week. You know, I was away last weekend and uh, we went to Worth Abbey. And lots to tell you about, lots happened. But on the first evening, out of London, clearing our heads, lovely supper, getting to know each other. And then just for a few minutes, we went into the Abbey Church. And unexpectedly, the monks were having a Eucharistic vigil to pray for vocations and so there was exposition of the blessed sacrament that evening from supper time until midnight and I haven't talked to the others about this but just walking into the church that evening into this beautiful monastic church into the presence of this monastic community praying with Jesus himself present in the blessed sacrament on the altar there was a there was a really tangible sense of the holiness of God present there in this church. Of course he's here with us now. He's here in every Catholic church in the tabernacle. He's here every time we celebrate Mass. But something in me maybe needed to go away to this place of beauty and of sanctuary and to walk into this church and actually not just to believe this but to to feel it, to feel it in my heart with my mind, almost in my very bones, that the Lord is here and and he's ready to meet us and we've come to meet him. But then, only yesterday, an experience that could not be different and yet the same, um, 50 of us yesterday, we went to Wembley Arena for flame. Now look, Wembley Arena, it holds 10,000 people. And I could see about 200 empty seats, so do your maths, yeah? About 10,000 young Catholics there to celebrate their faith. An amazing day of music and drama and dance and jokes and talks and famous people and experiences from refugees and fun and food, etc. But at the end of the day, perfectly timed, about half past four, the stage was emptied and then turned into a sanctuary with an altar. And in a moment of beautiful liturgy and prayer, again, we had the celebration of exposition. Um, Cardinal Vincent Nichols leading us in the worship of Jesus our Saviour on the altar, the same sacrament, the same holiness of Jesus that's here with us today, that was in the monastery last weekend, but here in the centre of London, in this place where there's normally boxing matches and and, and pop concerts and sports events, and and for us to be together worshipping the Lord, the most unexpected, unlikely place, but equally true and equally real. Very powerful experience. And actually, the silence in Wembley Arena yesterday afternoon, it was the same quality of silence that was there in the monastery in Worth. Very extraordinary. Uh, Thank God for that opportunity. And to see my point here, it's not that we can only meet Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, but it's knowing that we meet him there supremely, present with us, body, soul, blood and divinity. The real Jesus, true God and true man, knowing that we meet him there helps us to appreciate more and more his presence everywhere we go. In our own hearts, in the beauty of nature, in in the people that we meet, 
and trying to be more and more sensitive that the Lord we meet on the altar at Mass in these intense moments of presence with a capital P, it's the same Lord that we are trying to meet and trying to be sensitive to at every moment in our lives. Meeting the Lord, heart to heart, face to face. What a gift our faith is and let's, let's try to grow in that faith and that presence. But they're not just with him on the mountain. As I say, there's lots of listening. Um, Jesus is listening to Moses and Elijah. They're listening to him. Um, the, the apostles, are, are, are they listening in on this conversation? We don't know exactly, but they're there within this conversation. The father speaks to them. This is my beloved son. And he speaks about listening. Interesting, isn't it? He doesn't just say, listen to me. He says, listen to my son. And they do. Jesus speaks to them. So there's so much going on here, but, it, but it's a story partly about the importance of listening to each other and to God. And believing that the Lord is speaking to us. And this is the problem. Because honestly, often we, we stop believing that. We say, we know in faith, oh yes, I know God speaks to us. But we think, well, that's for the saints. Yes, that's for St. Margaret Mary and her visions. That's for St. Teresa of Avila. That's for St. Joseph and his dreams. But, but it's not me in my real life. And again, the importance of a retreat experience to help us reconnect with the reality, the truth, that God is speaking to us. And in fact, I, this was the theme of the retreat last weekend. Listening. Listening. That the Lord is not just speaking to the mystics and the saints. He's speaking to you and me. But for us to have the faith that he is and the sensitivity of heart and mind. And not to go through a long list, but just how he, he speaks to us in, in our heart in the quiet of our prayer he speaks to us through the responsibilities that we have and the duties he speaks to us through friends and family he speaks to us through the scriptures if we make a little bit of time to read and ponder the scriptures he speaks to us in the mass through the prayers maybe through the sermon he speaks to us through our conscience when it's awakened or pricked or nudged or perturbed he speaks to us in silence. He speaks to us in so many different ways. And lots of this can feel like just noise lots of the time, can't it? But the challenge is that we can have enough sensitivity and stillness of heart so that the noise becomes a sound and the sound becomes a voice. And this is a process. It's something we need to grow in and learn. And in fact, it's the same learning that was taking place last month in the week of guided prayer, when many of you, remember, were meeting with a prayer guide each day. It's not that they were giving you advice, is it? They were helping you to listen to the Lord. So again, what, what's, if you like, a, a, a takeaway from this? It's, it's to believe that God is speaking to us, not to give up. Not to get cynical or to think he's, he's not interested in me. He is absolutely interested in you. Yeah. You are his beloved. He adores you. He is absolutely head over heels in love with you. His friend, his sister, his brother, his son, his daughter. You are his beloved. He created you out of love. And everything in your life is important to him. The big things and the little things. And for you to believe that. And, and want to bring your life to him. In other words, that he wants to listen to you, believing that first, and then, in that conversation, believing that he's speaking to you. Uh, but it might take time and patience and a lot of discernment to see what is the voice within the noise. What's the picture, the pattern that emerges out of what seems like just chaos or, or accidents and so often, 
This is a, a hard truth, if you like. God is speaking to us through the events of life, isn't he? Circumstances. I might rather be somewhere else, but here I am. I might rather God had, had put something different before me, or even made me a different person. But this is who I am, this is where I am. Let me, let me begin here and, and listen to what he's saying and trust that he wants to guide and bless me. Listening. Trusting. And finally, the meeting, the listening, what then? Well, just like after the retreat we had to come home, Peter and James and John, they have to walk down the mountain with Jesus and go back to ordinary life. They have to, let me put it in my language, this isn't exactly the biblical language, after the listening, they have to take a step. The listening has to become a decision, a movement, a, a, a moving forward. And this is where we often get stuck. Now look, I'm not betraying any confidences here, but just to say in general, many of you in the last few weeks have shared with me your worries about feeling stuck. Yeah, Lots of pressures on you. Pressures of... Of, of studies and exams and dissertations and deadlines and jobs and internships and applications and 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 the feeling of feeling of many of you a bit paralyzed how do I move forward how do I know what God wants me to do how do I choose what module to do what application to, to put forward how do I know what to do this month this summer what to do with the rest of my life yeah I'm and the feeling of, of being, as I say, stuck and a bit paralysed and, and going round in circles. Um, and actually, you know all this. this. You read any pop culture blog, yes? You, you are millennials, yeah? You are defined by your optionality. You hate commitment. Yeah. A Facebook event, 700 people have pressed going. What does that mean? That means 17 will go. Yeah? And 600 and whatever it is. Uh, won't go and three are waiting just to see what the, the movement is on the scale before deciding yeah. you hate commitment not because you hate doing things but because to do one thing is not to do another and in fact we, we laughed about this yesterday but someone said on the tube going to flame they said to me oh yeah but Father Stephen yeah, if I do this if I choose to do this it means I can't do all the other things. And I looked at her kind of dumb, you know. Well, yes, that, that's what to choose means. <laughs> yeah? To choose one thing means not to choose the other 99. It's what the word decide means. Yeah, decidere. It means to make a mark, to make a line, a boundary. This is what I'm doing. You cannot do anything without not doing other stuff. And that's hard for us. It's hard for all of us, but it's especially hard not being patronising for you in your culture and the, the, the culture that, that we all live within to keep our options open. What's the term for this, the economic term? Shorting, yeah? You want to bet on the, the thing you want, but you want to also bet on the things that you won't go to cover your back. Yeah? Shorting. We want to do that in everything. I'll tell you a phrase that I learnt uh, at seminary it's not a religious phrase, but I found it hugely helpful. Lots of you have heard this before. The perfect is the enemy of the good. The perfect is the enemy of the good. In other words, if we're always seeking the perfect thing, the perfect choice, the perfect option, this is the thing that will make me ultimately infinitely happy and content and fulfill all my dreams and use all my potential and I'm not going to do anything until I've found this and if I do anything less than that I'm going to worry that I'm doing the wrong thing because I haven't done the perfect thing. Perf the, 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 the desire for perfection to do the perfect thing all the time is stopping us doing what is often the good thing. Something very beautiful and good and limited but that's here. Very often, 
it's better to do something well than to do a hundred things badly it's better to finish something than to leave a hundred things incomplete. or we'll put it even simpler it's better to start one thing than to go round and round in circles never starting anything and it's true for the simplest decisions and it's true for the big ones like vocation this isn't a thing of faith the perfect is the enemy of the good but our Christian faith helps us to go deeper into what it means because we're not just being realists or I have to do one thing rather than another thing our faith gives us a great trust in, in God's love for us in his guidance and his providence trusting that he's brought me here he's put these possibilities in front of me he wants me to do all that listening to weigh everything up and then to make the best decision I can in these circumstances and to step forward trusting in him do you see that the faith makes a difference then it's not just a kind of stoic realism it's a real trust I'm limited my options are limited um, but God loves me he's put me here for a reason these are my choices these are the possibilities I've talked I've prayed I've listened whether it's a very small thing a medium thing or a big thing let me pray talk think make the best decision I can and then step forward with great trust maybe I'll change my mind not many decisions define us forever but I'll do the best and I'll move forward and it gives us a confidence in our acting and our loving and, and our doing that isn't there if if we're trapped in uncertainty and indecision and look just to finish with with two examples from from my own life and I shared these on the retreat so I'm happy to share them here not to tell the whole story of my vocation or anything but just two moments I got stuck to illustrate what I'm saying here one was going round in circles about whether to become married whether to be married whether to become a Dominican priest whether to become a diocesan priest here in Westminster and really for two years going round and round in circles and and getting a bit of clarity but not enough I was paralyzed and and to cut a long story short part of the answer was realizing that I only had to take one step but I did have to take one step I couldn't take a step that guaranteed this was the right thing ordination was was six years down the line but I could take one step and that step for me was to apply to be a priest in Westminster Diocese and I said to myself I'll go for one year I'll go to seminary for one year and then I'll come home and I'll think about whether it's right or not uh, and just the possibility of taking it was a big step I'm not denying that saying to friends and family I'm going to seminary it was a big big step but it was just a step and it allowed me to move forward it set me free and then I could review it to use the management language yeah. one step the best decision I could trusting in God's help and the last anecdote just because it comes at the end of seminary so it shows you it's not just about starting it's about finishing as well just in the middle of my fifth year coming up to diaconate now priesthood's a big thing but diaconate to become a deacon is when you make your lifelong promises of celibacy and obedience so a big thing yeah and again I was a bit paralyzed um, in April when we went on retreat I knew lots more about the priesthood now I'd been on placements I'd done all my studies but something in me was thinking I just I can't do this you know I, I'm not sure I, I'm up to this I'm not sure I'm capable I'm not sure I can be a loving faithful priest real real self-doubt but going on the retreat and I remember where I was I remember the wall I was sitting on reading a passage from St John's Gospel where John the Baptist says speaking about Jesus this is what John the Baptist said he must grow greater I must grow less 
He must grow greater. I must grow less. And, and reading that, and in, in a, a blink of an eyelid, everything becoming clear. That it wasn't about me, what I could do on my own, the priest I was going to be, the great things I was going to do, the successes I was going to have. It was about me trying to listen to the Lord, to follow him, to take that step. And this step was towards priesthood. But trusting that taking that step with him, he would fulfil his plans for me. He would help me to do what was important. He would make up for my weaknesses and even work through and within my weaknesses. So, something very personal about priesthood. But you can see it applies to us all. yeah, And it applies to Peter coming down from the mountain. It's not to take every step. It's to take one step with the Lord. And it's to remember that if we do things in faith, humbly, trustingly, we never do anything alone. Everything we do, we do for him, but above all, we do with him and with his help.